Thanks for staying with us. Career transitions are like onions. They are complex and there is usually a lot more to them than we see on the surface. Whether you're pursuing a passion or a side hustle, confused about quitting your job for a new one or just looking for a change, know that it's not a straightforward decision. It requires careful planning and thinking through the way, the why, the what and the when. So what are the things you should take note of when you're planning to transition in your career? Please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818-038-4663. Tweet at us at WayShowAfrica1 with the hashtag WaysShow. So, this is a playback to last week. What was the one thing that you took away from our conversation last week? Um, yeah, so not to be afraid to make that change when mm -hmm. necessary, right? That's what, although that has always been my mantra, I'm, I'm not afraid to do anything. Mm. I don't know where I get that guts from, but if I set my mind to it and I say I want to do it, I definitely you will get it do done. it, yeah. yeah. So. I think that um, she talked about uh, people who, um, so the involuntary part of transitioning, yeah. saying that you lose your job, it mm -hmm. takes on average 9 to 16 months. months to be able to find a new job. And mm. of course, the focus last week was on the financial sure. aspect of it and what you need to do and how much you need to put away mm -hmm. um, to be able to do this. But um, I'm interested because today we're looking at all the other aspects of transitioning, um, like we said, what the why, the what, and the when, yeah. um, and to try and learn as much as we can. Because you know, for me, when it comes to transition, I'm just thinking, we have, um, what's it called now? Technology. Yeah. A lot of jobs today, in another five, ten years, mm. they won't exist. Mm -hmm. Technology would have taken over those jobs. Um, we've seen, even as we, you know, we currently are, even yeah. from the time of COVID, there are some things that just occupations that don't exist anymore, anymore. because they're now obsolete, they're redundant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not thinking about career transitioning, the topic today is so important because this is information that you can store in the back of your mind somewhere. And if you happen to find yourself in that situation, whether it's an involuntary Amazing, yeah. or voluntary, you start to think about what the options are, mm -hmm. even trying to identify new careers. I mean, when you talk to young people today, they're not thinking doctor, lawyer. At all. You hear things like influencer. <laughs> content creator. Content creator. <laughs> and you're like, my goodness, you know. So imagine, you know, a 50-year-old person or, you know, someone who's just retired mm -hmm. thinking, what is my next move? Mm -hmm. I spoke to my old boss today and he said, oh, he retires in September. And my initial sort of, you know, oh, excitement, congratulations. And then I realized that the twinge of his voice, he sounded a little like, mm, Maybe it's not such a great thing, yeah, right. you know, so, so topics like this just help our viewers to understand that, look, in every situation, like you said, don't be afraid to take the chances mm -hmm. um, and we'll see. But I'm looking forward to bringing our guest back. She's, yep. a, she's a friend of the house. Yeah. Vumile is the chief executive officer of Hesed Consulting, which is a coaching and consulting firm specializing in commerce acceleration, career coaching, women empowerment, facilitation and training on the African continent with presence in Nigeria, South Africa, Botswana, Kenya, the United States of America, Rwanda and affiliates in Namibia, Ghana and Uganda. She has coached in multinationals such as Google, ABSA, Investec Pri uh, Private Bank, Silica, FNB, Vodacom and Anglo-American. She joins us today via Zoom. Hello, Vimile. Good evening. Good evening, good evening, ladies. How are thank you? Thank you for joining oh, us. We're doing you. great. Lovely to have you again one yeah. week later, still looking <laughs> radiant. Good to be back. Awesome, awesome. Um, so you, you probably heard our banter as we were coming in. Um, like we said, you, you kind of gave us some insights last week around what to think about financially yeah. when you want to consider a career transition. But we want to sort of look at our options now, um, really on the broader aspect, you know, if you're thinking about the financial aspect, you probably started to think about career transitioning, but we sort of want to wind it back a little bit and say, you know what, what are the top three things? So the, the three categories that we're, we're talking about today, which is why do you want the change? What do you want to do? And when do you want to make the change? So I'm going to start off with the why um, and have you talk about or build on some of the things we talked on last week yeah. about the why. Why should you be considering a career transition? So there are a number of reasons why people have to consider the why, I suppose. And it underpins everything that we do. Sometimes the why is from a sense of purpose. Mm 
Sometimes the why is aligned to a career strategy. Sometimes the why goes back to what we spoke about last week, it being voluntary and involuntary um, reasons for you having to transition. So you understanding your why also makes it very clear where you have to trans, uh, transition to. So your why is absolutely critical because your why will also determine the where and the when. Excellent. So when we, when we talk about why, um, I know we talked about, like you said, the involuntary, the voluntary. Um, just to expand on that, because I think we talked about having a toxic work culture. Mm -hmm. What other kinds of things really um, could be triggers for people when they're thinking about the why? Often when people are thinking about the why, it's one of two drivers. It's short term or long term. So short term is that I cannot handle my boss. I'm very, very frustrated. I'm not stimulated at work. Um, it's just increased season and I don't feel valued at work. So it's very short term. Something's happened and triggered you to now consider wanting to leave this particular organization. So that's short term. Then also the why can also go into the long term where we're looking at, in essence, I chose to be in this organization for a certain period. I may have overstayed my welcome. I told myself I'd be here for three years. I'm now in year five and I'm ready for that next challenge. Or it could be a case of, according to my career strategy, the why is now. Now is the next move because of my career strategy. Also from a long-term perspective, it could be from a family perspective. I've been talking to lots of clients wanting to emigrate, saying they're no longer wanting to be on the continent. They're looking at going to the UK. They're looking at going to the US. Um, you know, the Japa phenomenon that's happening in Nigeria is actually happening quite a lot across the continent. So looking at that short term and that long term helps you determine how you maneuver as well. Because if it's, a, I've just had an awful fight with my boss, it's very short term and it's a very reactive approach. Whilst I'm looking at not just from a short term perspective, but a long term perspective is a more strategic uh, way to really approach your why. Okay, thank you, Vermili. So um, I know that some people get bored, right? So it's not that they're not passionate about what it is that they're doing. So they're in a particular industry, but then after a while, they just find out that they're bored with whatever it is they're doing at that time. And then they start to consider transitioning careers or switching careers and uh, maybe not necessarily moving to another organization that is doing the same thing. Now I'm talking about moving to an, another organization that is doing something entirely different from what it is they're used to because they're looking for a challenge or they're looking to do something that is more interesting now. So what do you think we should people should consider if they start to feel that way? I think when you have boredom in your workplace, you have a gift. Because what that means is you're at a place where you're peaking or some people feel like they're plateauing in the value they're able to give. But what that does mean is that you now have capacity to do something else with your time. I always say before you sign that resignation later, is there a master's degree you want to do? Is there a doctorate that you want to do? If work is not giving you that stimulation, can you get that stimulation elsewhere? Is there a training course that you've been putting off? Perhaps you're in the financial services sector and you've been putting off doing your CFA level one. Or perhaps you are you're in the marketing sector and you've been putting off joining the, um, the, the marketing um the marketing association and becoming a CM, a chief marketer, all of that are things you now have the capacity to do. So boredom allows you to focus on both education as well as continued professional development because you don't have the pressure of having to perform at a certain level of work because you're no longer seeking that stimulation solely from work. So before going outside of your industry or outside of your organization, think, is this an opportunity for me to actually pivot and take, take my work to that next level leveraging learning and development. Excellent. So before we pivot into the what, in terms of what do you want to do, mm. um, I want to ask, so I was reading the story about Jeff Bezos and of, of Amazon and how he made the transition. So he had a really good job working for a successful hedge fund and he you know, went to his boss one day and said, I want to... Um, you know, I want to start selling books on the internet. I want to start selling books online. He thought the internet was a great opportunity. And his boss took him out for two hours to have a conversation and say, you know, what do you think? Tell me about this. Um, but his boss was supportive. So what would you say, because when we start to talk about what you want to do when people are thinking about this, some people will think, oh, what will people think? So what, what are your thoughts around how people should handle the situation if they don't get the support that they're expecting from important people around them to make the change? 
I think when you don't get that support, it becomes important that you, in essence, create a new support structure. So people support you from the realm of reality. I recall, you know, leaving a a senior executive role in a telecommunications firm and going home and speaking to my mom and dad and saying, I'm going to be a coach. And they were very confused. They're like, you don't even play soccer. What are you talking about? (laughs) But they were speaking from their frame of reference. Mm -hmm. So I had to then say, where can I get that support? And I spoke to people who built coaching firms, who built consulting firms, and they became my support structure during the transition. So if you don't get the support initially off the bat from the people you typically rely on, you need to get comfortable knowing that there is no gap, that you can fill that gap, that support structure with new people who have the expertise, who can support you in that transition, specifically for that transition as a strategic one. Okay, a new, a, a, a new support structure definitely is a key one to take from there. Now, you knew what you wanted to do. You wanted to be a coach. What about the people who have no clue yeah. what they want to do? Yeah. Where did they start? So if you have no clue where you want to do what you're wanting to do, the first step is finding out where are you? What do you enjoy about your current employment? What do you not enjoy about your current employment? Um, there are lots of you know, um, techniques that we use in helping and supporting people delve into what works for them, what are they passionate about, what are they good at, um, what do people compliment them on, what do they actually want to spend their time doing. That we delve into your personality test, we look at your values, we look at your past history of enjoyment, we look at even things like your childhood inspirations. Uh, you know, I, I laugh at this now because you know, as a kid I used to put all my dolls together and want to teach them. So coaching is a different form of teaching, but that's exactly what I do. Um, That inspiration that I enjoyed as a child carries through. So sometimes stripping away the layers of what society has dictated to us to go back to what's in our essence core in our desires is a good indicator. It starts pointing us in the right direction of the place we should be investigating if we are to sort of transition our careers that should be passion based. Mm. Thank you, Vimele. So I was going to ask, how can you tell if what you actually want to do is change careers or just get a new job? You know, they're two different things, right? So some people want to switch careers totally and some people want to move to a new job doing the same thing they were doing in whatever organization, organization it is they were in football. How can you tell what exactly it is you want to do? That's a great point because when we look at career transitions, there are a number of different types of transitions. The first is from organization, no, the, the first is from department to department, mm. where you stay within the same organization, you love the culture, you love the people, you're probably in finance and you now want to move to sales, for example. So that's a career transition within itself, but within the same organization. Then you have, I love what I do, but I'm unhappy in this organization. And I want expertise from another organization. So let's say you are a marketeer, you work at one one audit firm, and now you're going to work at another audit firm. That is an inter-organizational, inter-industry transfer. So same, same job, different organizations. Then we've got different industries where you might find yourself in the fast moving consumer goods industry and you're wanting to go into the financial services industry. So you might still be uh, an accountant, but now in a completely different industry. Then you've got the ultimate career transition where you're saying different organization, different industry. Um, and completely different style of job where you're transitioning like I did from, you know, the financial services sector um, into telecommunications, from telecommunications into the into the human co- capital consulting sector where I'm doing something completely and utterly different. The reason for those transitions are very, very different. So you need to go back to say, okay, I love what I, I love the organization, but I'm frustrated in the role that I do. So I'm happy to stay here, leverage what I know, and then do that inter-organizational transfer. Or it's a case of I've learned as much as I can in this particular organization. This culture is no longer serving me. I'm feeling a little bit stuck and I feel I can be grown and stretched, still mastering this particular discipline in another organization. Then you say, I'm stay in the industry, but I'm going to take my expertise to another organization. Then, of course, we've got now where we're saying, actually, even the industry 
for me is not what I'm looking for. And this happens a lot as different industries look for different expertise. We're seeing trends right now what we're in the financial services sector. There's been a massive drive for people in the arts and people in engineering for the school of thoughts, where typically it used to be commerce that was required. So that's a little bit of a different thing, where you're now being recruited into a different industry. And then, of course, the ultimate is to say, I've got the expertise. I've worked in this particular organization, in this particular industry, for several years, and I just want a complete and utter disruption. And that, for me, is usually the, the career transition that most people really battle with. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about thinking about myself as a hiring manager um, and having someone who wants to transition careers sit in front of me. Now, I remember you talking about, um, you even mentioned it today, getting a master's, getting certifications. But I find that the further you get away from having been in, in academia, like in university, right, and the more you work, uh, your, your work experience becomes a lot more um, important and a lot more relevant. Now, if I'm making what you've called the ultimate change, so I'm changing, you know, industry, I'm changing, you know, all of that, how do I convince hiring managers sitting across the table from me to pick me over someone else who has experience in the industry when I'm trying to transition? The best thing to do is to really sell your ability to solve the problem they're solving for. Every time you're in front of a hiring manager, every time you're in front of a, an HR executive or someone who's looking to fill a role, there's a problem in that organization that they are looking for you to solve. Your ability to understand and comprehend that problem is the first key. The second is then saying why your current experience is the best answer. And often, a lot of us actually don't even start applying because we're like, I don't have experience in that. And experience isn't always the best solution. So what do I mean? Um, I mentioned moving from the financial services sector, being an, uh, you know, head of uh, executive and operations, to running strategy in a telecommunications company. And the first thing I was able to say, in essence, was you are starting to get regulated that's never happened. You've never been as regulated as, you, as you've been in the past year in your industry. I come from an industry that's been regulated for hundreds of years. I understand how to respond to regulation. So yes, you can pick someone from telecommunications who knows the lay of the land, but is also responding and not really knowing what to do in solving this problem. This is a problem I've solved over and over again in my industry. Let me give my expertise to help you solve it. So your ability to position yourself as the best choice in the long term makes sense. So I think for me, our, our understanding of the expertise we bring to the table and our ability to answer the why for the hiring manager, the why for the HR executive, will often supersede not having had experience in that sector if you can prove your ability and your track record to solve that particular problem. Mm, quite profound. I, I was just going to ask that same question because, mm. I, so let me use myself as an, as an example. So right now I do business development for real estate, right? Mm -hmm. And just two days ago, someone sent me a message and said, oh, hi, Chanel. So uh, my friend's looking to hire a business development manager for a fintech. And I stepped back for a bit. I, you know, I saw all of the, he sent me all the details, the offer. And I'm like, ah, I told my friend, interesting. But guess what? I've never worked in fintech. So I don't even know what the finance space is. I've never had any experience in finance at all. Mm. And I was like, um, I'm not sure if I can if I should apply for this because I don't have any experience with fintech and then from the requirements it says at least three years experience in the finance mm. or fintech space. Now, Vumile, how do I go, and this is first-hand question now, how do I go about this? What, what would you advise? What do you think I should do? So, I love that question because also when we see a job spec, we must realize that a job spec is a company's dream guy. We all know, right? In our dream world, we want someone who looks like Idris Elba, has Dangote's money, um, but is like so sweet and caring, like it could be your brother. This is your dream guy. And then you're gonna go and just date a simple chuku, like he's just like he's just a guy. We settle. And the same is true for organizations. That job spec is their dream candidate. But hiring managers are very much aware that what they're seeking, will they will not get 100% of. So what you do is then you break down the job spec. Of this job spec, what do you mean? 
what do you meet? And what's always an interesting statistic is how men and women view it a little bit differently. Typically, a man will see 40 to 65% and say, I'm good enough to apply. A woman will only apply typically if she meets a minimum of 80% of the criteria. So the first is being kind to yourself and knowing I am not going to be the Idris Dangote person. I can probably get 40 to 60% of this right. But what is the core functionality? Can I answer the core functionality? Am I a great salesperson? Yes, I am. Do I have any engagement with finance? Yes, I do. I've worked with a bank before. I've been a customer, so I understand the experience. Am I engaging and interested in tech? Yes, I am. I'm always on my phone. And I actually read a few tech magazines and I know what some of the trends that are coming. So, so I've got a bit of an understanding. Then, of course, the research component is then deep diving into understanding the organization, understanding the space, and then understanding where are the shortcomings. And a lot of us underestimate the ability to ask simple questions that will shift how an organization behaves. So I remember coming into telco, I used to ask, why do we do that? And all of a sudden people were like, um, actually, we've always just done that historically. I'm like, can we change it? And things changed like that. So you cannot underestimate the value you bring to the table. And also another thing, remember you used to be a teacher, right? So you understand how young people are working. That's their target audience. You had years engaging their target audience. Bring that as an advantage as opposed to actually I've never, I didn't work in commerce in that time. As opposed to I was engaging your target audience. I know how they think. I get their psyche. So from a customer user experience, this is some of the things I potentially could add. Thank you very much, Mimi. That's such a nice, <laughs> um, fresh perspective. Yeah. So when we started the conversation today and with our quote, we were talking about dreaming big. And I love the example that you just used about Idris Elba slash Dangote. <laughs> so a lot of people in that scenario can spend their whole lives waiting for the Idris Elba yeah. slash Dangote. So what is there a way, um, or should I not say is there a way, what should people be assessing and thinking about? Is there any transition that is too big is me sitting here thinking i'm going to be the next beyonce is it realistic should i be thinking that big from a career so is there some way to sort of assess wow is this realistic or is this something that i might do long term short term i mean should there be any limitations when you're thinking career transition i think there should be no limitations but there should be a, a, a very healthy dose of realism so if you're wanting to transition to a particular industry, you have to see the trends within that industry, right? So um, I was watching actually an interview with Ashake, who I love, right? And if we had had that conversation 20, 30 years ago about him being in Good Morning America, um, speaking about Afrobeats, it would have seemed 30 years ago not quite feasible. But the trends in the industry in the past five years indicated that his ability to be more successful were higher. So analyze your industry. Analyze it from a 10-year trajectory to a five-year to a three-year to a one-year. What are the trends? If you know that to be the the CEO of a, of a, of a top 400 um, company, you're going to need a master's degree, you might want to start with the master's degree before saying you're wanting to be the CEO. So looking at the trends and the requirements becomes important. Me saying I want to be a brain surgeon, there has been no brain surgeon who has not completed their undergraduate degree in medicine. So me saying as an accountant background, I'm going to all of a sudden do surgery, that trend does not exist. So you need to study the industry you are wanting to enter into. There are some anomalies, but the chances of you being the anomaly is often very much vested on your talent, very much vested on your networks. So if you don't necessarily have that, then the likelihood of you being an anomaly is just simply not realistic. Interesting. So dream big, but be realistic, realistic and get some information. Okay. So I think we can start to talk about the when. So we sort of picked apart the why and the what. Um, now, when will the change happen? I had a very interesting conversation with a colleague many years ago where he said um, he had what he called a no matter what date. Mm. So on that date, um, he was going to, to quit. Mm. His goal was to become a CEO and 
on this part of his journey was getting the experience he was getting at our current job yeah. and then that no matter what date no matter what happened on that date he would quit because this part of the cycle was, was done over. so what are the things that really start to bring us to that point of knowing the when um, beyond just being financially ready so I think self-assessment becomes critical the, the skills gap, the knowledge gap, the experience gap, the network gap, all of that determines the when. So from where you are to where it is that you're wanting to be and the requirements to get there, that will determine your when. And that will be based on your research. I spoke about looking at your industry. I didn't also speak about um, looking at yourself and assessing yourself to then determine that. So if you, if you know, okay, you wanted to be CEO, I know I knew at 30 that I was going to want to run my own business, but there were things that needed to exist. I needed to collect the networks. I needed to become known in particular industries. I needed to travel a lot of the continent because I wanted to run a pan-African business. I needed to study in the UK. I needed to have experience in the Americas. So all of that could not happen in the three-year period giving myself a decade to do it. And I love the saying that says, we often overestimate how much we can do in a year, but very much underestimate how much we can do in a decade. So I tend to plan my lives in decades because I can fill them in. So looking and saying, okay, that decade is how long I'm giving myself to get the networks, get the finances, um, make sure that all the, all the academic requirements are met, make sure that all the skill requirements are met. All of that will determine when. Because you can be, you can have, you can have the why, you can have the, you know, what it is that you want you to do. But if you are not giving yourself enough time, it simply is not going to happen. And of course, a dream that's just, you know, just a wish, it becomes just a wish if you don't have that enough time in order to realize it. Excellent. I think we've packed so much in into the conversation mm -hmm. so far. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back to continue the conversation. Stay with us. If you're just tuned in, you've missed quite a bit as we're discussing the topic planning career transitions with Vumile Mswili. Please hear, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818-038-4663. Tweet at us at Wayshow Africa One with the hashtag Wayshow. So, do you have a question? Okay, so um, we're talking about when, right? So, um, why? Mm -hmm. When? When, okay. Mm -hmm. So, my question is, you know, I've asked about how, okay, I know that now I want to move, I'm probably doing something, um, let me use an example of being in the finance sector now. This thing, this thing about me and finance sector recently, I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, being in finance, and then I know, okay, you know what, I think I want to do entertainment, and, or oh, I want to do media, and... I don't have um, any experience, so to speak, in the media or the entertainment industry, but I know that that's something I enjoy. I will enjoy doing because I have never tried it, but then it's something that I, I think I'll enjoy doing. I sometimes imagine myself in the bathroom and then I have all these really cute dreams and, you know, big dreams, like we said. Um, I know that that's, that's a... Um, a a nudge for me to know, okay, you know what, maybe the next thing you should start doing is find places that you can put in that energy, you know, on the side, even if you're still doing your regular nine to five or whatever else it is that I'm doing on the side. But at the same time, in some of these industries, people would then say, like Uti rightly said earlier, experience, they would ask you, okay, so what have you done before? Where have you been? What's give us some people even go as far as asking you for a portfolio, you know, mm. and things like that. When you're faced with such situations, I mean, what do you do? How do you navigate such such situations? A lot of them, you get the experience, right? So no one, I know, and this is, I love that example because it's very practical to me. I thought I would be so good on radio. I thought it'd be great. I could do this. It was like, oh, we love your voice. You should do radio. 
But when I approached some of the big radio stations, they weren't interested. They're like, where's your demo? Um, let's hear what else have you, what have you done? So what I did is in essence, I went to a university radio station and I volunteered to read the news. And I did that for several months. And then I said, can I actually now have a bit of my own business show? And I took that over for a couple of months. So by the time some of the biggest radio stations in Botswana, in Nigeria and South Africa that I now am on, I had a portfolio of evidence because I simply also didn't know the technicalities of radio. Mm -hmm. I didn't know which buttons to press. I didn't know how to work with a producer. I, I didn't have any of that. And even when approaching some of those big radio stations to begin with, I did it completely voluntarily. I was like, I started producing myself, uh, pitching to a producer. She liked some of it and worked with me for a year. So by the time I'm saying you need to start paying me for these services, it made sense. There's certain things that unfortunately, the technical experience, you simply cannot do. It goes back to the medicine example. You can study the theory of medicine. So many people have done an undergraduate degree in medicine and are great doctors in theory. But still, you're not going to allow yourself to go into surgery with someone who's simply never cut before. Mm. They've got to practice with a cadaver. Then they've got to be overseen and, and supervised by a special resident doctor. Mm -hmm. And they spend years doing that. And only then are they unleashed in the world to go and have patients on their own. So when technica technical competency is required, unfortunately, you do have to earn your stripes. You do have to get comfortable knowing you've either got to volunteer or you've got to build that credibility over time. There's some transitions where you can bring previous experience and that can pivot and add value to the next job. But there's some where the technical competence is so steep and so, so required that you simply could not do the job with your eyes closed without having had that experience. Mm. So if I hear you correctly, Vumili, you're saying up your skills, right? Mm. Mm. And don't be afraid of volunteering to do so. Mm. If you have a clear understanding of where it is that you're wanting to be, you need to get comfortable volunteering. You know, you, people often see, see the success stories, not realizing that that, that success story, yeah. the foundation was often in not getting paid, was often in apprenticeship, was often mm. in earning your stripes in order to gain that credibility. Yeah. I love the fact that you shared your radio story. It's very similar to mine. So people ask me these days, oh, how is it that you're so, you know, you're just, it seems so effortless. I'm like, I started doing hospital radio when I was 16. I did university radio. I went from actually doing university radio to realizing I wanted to DJ, I DJed, and like I've been all over the shop. I think TV was the last bit for me to close that, that gap. So my Oprah dream, I've, I've yeah, subconsciously yeah. been doing yeah, the work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> keeping away, keeping away at it. Success stories. Yeah. So tomorrow when they see you as a manager, they don't want to know the work that you do. I'm doing. telling you, it's a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah. But I want to touch on something. Um, I think that everything we've talked about so far, Vamilia, has been very positive. Um, the fact that you know the why, you figure out the what, um, you get your funds in place, and you know, then you go and do it. The when happens, and it all goes swimmingly. But... Um, I want us to add a pinch of, a pinch of pessimism and realis <laughs> realism to it. Not everyone is going to be successful in their career transition. Um, if you find yourself in a place where things aren't going as planned, what should you do? I think having a very honest conversation with yourself. Um, sometimes a lot of us overstay our welcome in a career transition because we are holding on to the hope of what could be as, as opposed to the reality of what is, right? So it's similar to, um, it's very similar to entrepreneurship. We all know that a minimum, a minimum of 60% of businesses are going to fail. Yet somehow when we are the ones failing, we're refusing to see that this is not this is not working in particular. So I think having an honest conversation helps. Your research is also going to be a great indicator, right? So you're going to start seeing that the trend state that by year one, year two, year three, this is where you should be in your career. This is where you should be in your business. And if it's not happening, you have to ask yourself, is this an anomaly because the industry is new? Or is this an anomaly because I'm doing something wrong? And understanding that becomes very, very important. And there's a difference between the data versus how we feel. Because often I say, like I was having this conversation, I think a couple of nights ago, we were saying at the dinner table, I believe in the rule of three. Things often take three times longer than what we think. They often cost three times more than what we think. And 
when you when you've given it that time period and it's still not working, then you must grace it graciously accept defeat. Take the owl, learn the lesson, and keep it moving. Because I'm also a big believer in that nothing is ever wasted. And I don't know one successful person who says everything I've ever touched was gold. They learn more from their failures than their successes. And I think that fear of failing sometimes keep, keeps us going as opposed to us accepting the lesson. And I think for me, we must remember that failure is nothing more than feedback. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Um, I think that um, I, I was going to ask the question on fear, but then you've just sort of talked about it because I think fear is the number one reason that a lot of people won't even think about or consider um, a career transition in this part of the world. Like you said, if it takes nine to 16 months to um, find a new job, then why do I want to give up the one that I have now to then go and do something where I don't have any assurances, I don't have any guarantees um, around what will happen? So um, when we talked about the what, we talked about people not knowing what they want to do. But then we didn't talk about the sort of side of people who maybe have a side hustle or have a passion. How do they sort of make that work to eventually transition? So I love it because we call it the gay economy or the shared economy. Mm. And it's where the world is going. We anticipate that by the year 2030, one billion people are going to be part of that economy. Mm. One billion people can be freelancers and not just employed full time. We're already seeing the trends of Uber, of Airbnb, where where um, assets aren't owned but are utilized for a portion. So that side economy, that that side that side gig, the gig economy, the shared economy, there's definitely a space for it. And of course, we also know that for you to become very wealthy, you need several revenue streams. So yes, definitely have one. But when to know to transition to say actually. I've been working at this particular employer. My side hustle has actually started generating so much revenue that I potentially should be focusing on it. I think for me is a time and energy question. Do you have time to grow it? And if you were to spend your time, where would you spend it? With your employer or with your side gig? The second is the energy piece. The energy expended is not just when it's fun and it's your side hustle that you get to escape to. It's now having to deal with the reality that it's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. It's going to come with things you don't in particular like. Coaching was my side gig. I did it after hours. It was so much fun. And then I built a business around it. And all of a sudden, I have to deal with tax. I have to deal with admin. I've got to deal with managing people. Um, it, it was not just a fun coaching piece. So realizing that your side gig, when you decide to get over that fear, then becomes a full-time job is also the reality we have to face. Mm. And then the question of fear. And fear for me is not so much fear as it is regret. We are afraid of the unknown, and that's often because we fear the unknown more than we fear regret. And for me, I fear regret. I fear Waking up in front of God and saying, oh, my goodness, I could have done that. Oh, I wish I tried. That is, that I'm afraid of that more than I am afraid of the unknown. So having to balance that for me becomes important. Is would you rather have tried or would you rather have never even attempted? And also we have to have an honest conversation about the seasons in our life. Sometimes the seasons in our life don't allow that. You know, there's a season where, for example, you have young children, the, the consequences of your actions, the ramifications are not just you. So it makes the fear quadruple because the ramifications and the stakes are substantially higher. Mm -hmm. So you also then have to decide based on the stakes what would make sense. I know when I jumped off and I did my own business, I was single, I was alone, I had properties. So the risks were, if all else fails, I just go back to corporate. Mm -hmm. The risks were substantially lower. If you wake me up now and you say, Vumi, would you do the same thing right now? Because of the season of where I am in my career, I would choose stability and something secure over the risk I took of becoming an entrepreneur. Mm. Yeah. So the timing is really, really critical, if I hear you correctly. So the same person, mm. different timing and different season in life would make different decisions. Um, decisions. So that's quite powerful. Um, time really does fly when you're having fun. So we're, we're just about coming towards the end of the show. And I'd like to take the rest of the show to sort of have you 
Almost, we've talked about a lot in the last two weeks. Um, give us a paint by numbers. Here's a step one. You know, here's 10 steps you should take when you're looking to transition your career. And then tell us, um, I mean, you're a coach. I'm sure that you've worked with several, several clients um, who are on this journey of career transitioning. Um, share with us maybe some of the most interesting things that people have realized along the journey that maybe they didn't think of or didn't expect at the time. Okay, so for me, the I guess I'll call them the six steps to consider. Mm -hmm. First, self-assessment, baseline. Evaluate your current skills. Where are you? Um, and in, what of these skills can I transfer? What of these skills and experience do I need to acquire to get to where it is that I'm wanting to be? So that's the first bit. bit. And that is underpinned by the second step, which is research. Research, research, research. Look at the trends, look at the numbers, look at what's required. It's going to be important. Then the practicality of training and education. How do I start acquiring the skills? How do I acquire the academic qualifications? How do I acquire the people I'm going to need? Which takes me to the fourth step around networking. Who do I need? Who should I be speaking to? What should I be reading? What's the information I need to completely immerse myself in, in order to ensure success? And what we delved in a lot is the fifth step last week, your finances. What is your budget? You know that if you are sitting in Nigeria, the cup that, that uh, uh, six to nine months that it's going to take you to get another job is a reality. Do you have savings for that? Do you need to downgrade your lifestyle? Have you planned accor accordingly, financially for that transition? And then, of course, the timeline. How long is it going to take realistically? And what happens if that timeline isn't met? Have I thought about the ramifications of having to make that career transition? Those, for me, are the things you thoroughly need to investigate and, and really interrogate in order, to, in order for you to have a solid plan for your career transition. And when I think about uh, probably the most interesting career transitions I've held, and funny enough, both were doctors. Oh. One was wanting to go into being a makeup artist, but didn't want to lose the qualification. And we helped to grow an aesthetics business, which thrived. And she was one of my favorite clients. Um, absolutely thrived. And she makeup was a side gig in her passion. And she was able to take her nine to five and merge it with a side gig, where she literally could, you know, started doing dermatology um, and also was able to do your makeup on the weekends, which was fantastic. And, it, and it's a business that's really worked well for her. The second is a medical doctor who wanted to become a CEO. And she had never worked a day in corporate. And she thought, I could never work with work in corporate. I, I know this is the process when, we, when you're a doctor. And I said, that's a great thing. You understand process. You are a doctor, which means you thoroughly understand the importance of a bedside manner, which is just customer experience. You understand systems. You've learned the human body system. Mm. If you study the system of this particular organization, you can probably find out what's wrong quite quickly. And all of a sudden she was like, I've never thought of it like that. She pitched and is now the CEO of in, in corporate and is doing very, very well. So don't allow what you don't know to take away what you can bring from a values perspective. She didn't know finance. And I said, you don't need to know finance. That's what the chief financial officer is for. She was like, but for me, I don't understand marketing. That's what the chief marketing officer is for. Mm. You know what it's like. You go into theater. You've got your needs to supporting you. You've got great nurses, you've got aftercare, you've got the physio to help you post. You know how to lead a team. The job of a CEO is to successfully lead a team. Once that clicked, she thrived. So I think it's very, very important that we're able to do the same thing. What's the value that I can bring? What's the knowledge of my gaps? Who can help me fill those gaps in order for me to successfully transition into a career that I'm ready for um, in the future? Excellent. Thank you so much, Famile. As always, it's an amazing time with you on Ways. We look forward to having you back again to discuss. I mean, you're so versed, you know, versatile that, you know, we could pick any topic and you could probably talk about it. So we look forward to having you on the show again. Thank you so much, Chinelo. I've Thank had you. fun on this. Okay.
tired Friday <laughs> evening for the both of us. Um, oh. But looking forward to the weekend and uh, an awesome week next week. So before you, um, we go, please ensure that you follow us on Instagram at Show Africa. You can interact with us further, drop a comment, and most importantly, follow all our social me media engagements. And remember to like, share, comment, and invite your friends and family to watch us and follow us. If you missed today's quote, here it is again. Without leaps of imagination or dreaming, we lose the excitement of possibilities. Dreaming, after all, is a form of planning. That's by Gloria Steinem. So we'll see you again on Monday at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Have a good evening.